Father God, thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for this time to come worship you. Uh, we ask you please help us through this week, through the rest of our lives, and just be with us in our every day. And we ask you to please speak your word to Pastor Jose and give us all the message we need to hear. Um, and we just thank you for everything. Well, good morning, everybody. Duffy, or buddy, will you run the computer? Okay. You're fine. Yeah, we, we're we're bu- busy this morning. Yeah, that's what happens when somebody goes on vacation or quits. Well, uh, we're going to use our Bibles today. (laughs) That's why we're here, right? Um, There's a lot of worry in the world. Susanna, can you? Oh, no, we're good. That's perfect. We're going to go read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It says, and, and Timothy is written by Paul, and he's writing to or, or, to the church that Timothy is pastoring, and he, Timothy's a young young pastor like me. Actually, he's a lot younger than I am, but um, he's writing to his church. So, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, 1 through 5. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared. Whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to the sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, I want to emphasize the you on that. We live in a me, 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 or I, I, I time. I had a pastor bring up the selfies and how selfish we are, and it's like we live in the time of selfies. pretty selfish time 
But the truth part is what the truth and people turning away from the truth. There's more warning in 2 Timothy, but we have to go backwards. I love reading backwards. So now we're going to go to chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Jonas and Jambres. <coughs> I'm missing one. I think I put it in there, though. Hebrews 13, is that next? Did I put it on your guys? I didn't put it on my paper. Okay. This, these two chapters, or these two portions in 2 Timothy, does it sound familiar? Does it feel like maybe he was writing to us now, I'm sure that other times have said this. Actually, I have a little bit of proof, and we're going to get to that later. We're going we're gonna to write, we're going to listen to some proof from 1965. That was a long time ago. Well, it wasn't that long ago. So now we're going to move over to Hebrews 13. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Give honor 
to marriage. Hmm. I'm not doing that. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. I'm just going to say it again. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? It's interesting the songs that Buddy picked. And they fall in line with what we're reading today. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange, new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which don't help those who follow them. We have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest brought the food of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin, and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Pray for us, for our conscience is clear, and we want to live honorably in everything we do, and especially pray that I will be able to come back to you soon. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to pay attention to what I have written in this brief exhortation. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released from jail. If he comes here soon, I will bring him with me to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the believers there. The believers from Italy send you their greetings. May God's grace be with you all. These are heavy-hitting verses and chapters. He quoted Deuteronomy, and so I want to go back and read it. Deuteronomy 31.6. Deuteronomy is a book in the Old Testament. (laughs) Sorry, that's a little joke. (laughs) So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid 
and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. There's a lot of verses in the Old Testament that get used out of context. But because Paul used this in Hebrews, as he's pointing out the call on each and every one of you. And so when we combine these things, when we combine that there's so much worry in this world because this world sucks. It's really bad and it's getting worse. Those end time descriptions that we were reading in 2 Timothy, we're seeing it play out today. Should we be afraid and start packing up and getting ready to go home tomorrow though? Again, I'm going to show you evidence of this happening in 1965. Even in the preparation, he's saying, go out and do the work. Go out and do what you're called to do. When you get there, though, somebody is going to be selling you a new God. Somebody's going to be selling you a fake truth. We are in the time of lies. The truth is being snuffed out. Lies are being passed off as truth. Or in politics, we get a sandwich. We get a truth, a lie, and a truth. So we believe it all as truth. The media, our eyes are so deceiving Our eyes lie to us all the time. Want to know a truth? Here's a truth. The enemy hates the truth. The best way to shut up the truth, to change the truth, happens with the kids. When I first started in the ministry, there was this big issue. The issue was, how do we get the kids that graduate from Sunday school and youth group back into church after they've grown up. And the more I researched it, is we were telling them a lie. That lie looked like a truth. We taught them that church was going and sitting in a classroom and learning from a teacher but it wasn't from the pastor. So they grew up. And we expected them to come in and sit down in church. But that wasn't church to them. What was their truth? Their truth was sitting in a little wooden chair. We have a bunch of them still. Duffy's sitting in one. So what was church? What was the truth about church? I'm going to sit in a chair like this. I'm going to color a page. I'm going to have a snack. I'm going to sing a song. I'm going to remember a verse out of context. And then we look around and we say, where are all the 20-year-olds? Where are all the 25-year-olds? Why isn't it, or why is it that People aren't coming back to church until they have kids in school. Now they're 30. And 
And we have people that say young people are stupid. Well, old people are stupider. (laughs) We know the truth and choose the lie. We know the right way and will choose the wrong way. That was Kamala Harris that said that. I have an issue with politicians, all politicians. I made a small list, and I'm sure that this list could go on forever, of things we learned as kids that even though our reasonable brain says, there's no way that's true, but we still believe it because we were taught as kids. Either our, our parents taught us this, our grandparents taught us this. I remember being so afraid that I was going to go to jail or that my mom was going to go to jail if we turned the dome light on in the car while driving at night. I thought, 100%, we're going to jail. I got to find something. Well, you can't turn on the light because we're going to jail. Anybody else have that memory? Or did anybody else tell that lie? Sorry. (laughs) Santa. The Easter Bunny, the Boogeyman, I did a little bit of research on Santa. Do you guys know that Coke changed the image of who Santa was because they wanted to sell more Coke? Coca-Cola. Well, they were selling Coke at one time too, but (laughs) Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola sales went down in December. So they drummed up a way of selling more Coca-Cola in the winter. How many people believe that if you go outside after a shower with your hair wet, you're going to get sick? Catch cold. Well, what about swimming? You go swimming, you get your hair wet, and you're outside. Well, that's in the daytime. Well, what if you go at night? <laughs> you got you to wait 30 minutes. Why do so many of those things that we were taught as children... Even though we know better, even though we are more intelligent, we're less stupid, right? (laughs) But we can't change those things. So now, as adults, we know that the things that we were taught, even though they were lies, as kids, now that we're adults, we still will reference them. So why not give the kids the truth now? Why not teach them how to sit in church? We are. And yeah, they get a little bit antsy, but old people fall asleep. I mean, either way, nobody wants to listen to me. We currently did a study on, uh, on Exodus. And do you guys, okay, sorry, I'm not calling you out. I, I apologize if, if I offend you, but 
How many people loved the movie The Ten Commandments? Yeah, Charlton Heston. One of the most beautiful men to ever be born. I mean, he is tall, he's got the jawline, he's got the muscles. Looks amazing in the movie. Do you know how many people still read the book of Exodus and think, well, somebody cut out these things that were in the movie but aren't in the Bible? Where's this beautiful girl? She's not even mentioned. How come in the Bible it doesn't sing, let my people go? So we have issues with what we see versus what we know. We also have issues with what we learned first or learned at a young age trumps whatever we learn as we get older. And the kids are being taught by images and stories, but I'm sure that they can't quote their textbooks, but I bet if you ask them for the image, they can tell you. One of those biggest images is the missing link. And the missing link is... It has a very, very important word in there. And it's not the and it's not link. It's missing. Because it's never been found. So I came up with a, a way, just real quick, on how to explain this. Imagine, first, imagine. Imagine you're playing cards with somebody. And you say, I win. Because if I had another ace, I would, I would beat you, so I, I beat you. Well, no, you don't have that other ace, so you can't beat me. Or you say, well, actually, imagine that I have a card that doesn't exist, never been seen, but it's better than yours, and imagine that I have that. Now I win. That makes zero sense. None, none whatsoever. This missing link only fits if the missing link is not missing. But that's like saying I have this card that nobody knows exists in my hand, so I win. So we have people that read things, that read the Bible and call it a liar. Why is it a liar? Because there's something that we believe either from our childhood, from school when we were young, or something we saw with our eyes. Things that we see with our eyes make more sense than what's reasonable and true. We must protect the youth. How do you protect the youth? With the truth. You equip them with the truth and with a way to go find the truth. I was recently uh, watching a video of a man that went to prison. And the interviewer asked him, when did it change? 
And he said, well, when I started off in school, I loved learning. I was the top of my class. He says, I loved kindergarten. First grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. He says, and then I went to middle school. And being smart got me made fun of. It got me beat up. And so I changed. And I started making fun of smart kids and beating them up. This was a 30-something-year-old man who ended up living a life of crime, theft, drugs. And when did it start for him? In seventh grade. And these are the people we call stupid. These are the people that we say, well, they don't know anything. Don't ask them. They're too young. They're too dumb. They don't have enough worldly knowledge. They don't have enough experience. But if you're going to push them aside, you just made them available to somebody else. And that somebody else is the enemy. And he's the one that is going to say, yay, they pushed another kid aside. Now I can give them my truth. Now I can make the truth look like a lie. I'm going to teach them to hate church. I'm going to teach them to hate Christians and God and seek knowledge. So maybe not every kid is going to go off and be a criminal. But how many kids get pushed away from church? We're going to do the YouTube video, so you're going to have to close this. We're the devil. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the... So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. <laughs> and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? 
I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. 1965. Have we progressed? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> We've gotten better at sin. Good job. There's an achievement. Now, now we have smartphones. Paul Harvey didn't even know about smartphones yet. How many more things pass before our eyes? How many more things, fake quotes, do we see? Things that challenge God. Things that challenge morality. Our kids are being shown images, and they believe it as truth. Why? Because it's inside of a textbook. Now, if it's inside of a textbook, it must be true, right? But are we as parents doing the same thing, showing them images and saying, this supports truth from the beginning. Can we go to the image, image one? What is that? Anybody know? That is a wagon wheel or a cartwheel. A chariot wheel. And that is at the bottom of the Red Sea, which, according to the books, no Egyptians ever got drowned by the Red Sea. Because how would they drown in the Red Sea? They'd have to go into the water. How would they go into the water? There's no way that the seas were pulled apart. Right? So there, kids... When you're reading the book of Exodus, when you're watching the cartoon uh, Prince of Egypt or the really long movie, The Ten Commandments, and the Egyptians were drowned because the waters came back together. And what they found was that. And do you guys know why it's still in the shape of a wheel? Coral can't stick to gold. That's something I learned today. So on a lot of those wheels, they were plated with gold. So, so you still have the coral shaping around it, but, you know, why it's not just a big ball of coral is because the coral can't stick to the gold. So. Next slide. Should be a third image in that same picture. What do you guys think that is? If you were to explain that picture, what would you be able to come up with or surmise in any way, shape, or form? Somebody cut it? Have you guys ever seen a rock like that? Ever? Paul, you traveled lots of places. You ever see a rock like that? <laughs> a lot of rocks. That's one rock. And it looks like 
maybe that cut was for a reason. Next slide. So in, in the book of Exodus, the people get thirsty. And it said that Moses was instructed to strike a rock and water began to flow from it. We probably imagined the side of a mountain. Go back. This is an undescribable rock in the desert where it looks like water just started flowing from out from the middle of it for no reason. But these images aren't shown. They're definitely not giving any context. Instead, the book of miracles, which is what we have, is being passed off as a book of myths. Yet nobody can explain this. And if we read this and we say, hey, here's a supporting image of the truth that everybody is denying. Now we see with our eyes and we say, well, I believe just a little bit more because I had, I, I didn't know what to expect. We are in a war. Think of it as a game or a fight. And the enemy is winning. Your pastor tells you, read your Bible. The Bible tells you to read your Bible, but of course you have to go read your Bible to go be told to read your Bible. And we have some of the most amazing people in Hollywood that should just make the Bible into a movie so I don't have to read my Bible, but I could watch my Bible. Like, I'll go get popcorn. Because we want our eyes to tell us what to believe. Now, here's my favorite. I don't have time to read. Give me your phone. I'll go look at how much time you spent. You guys know what that is? Swiping up to the next video. I'm actually pretty good with my thumbs. Others say, I don't understand, so I don't want to read it, because I don't understand it. Well, let me take you back, and there was a time that there was this mechanism with two wheels and tires on it, and you didn't know how to ride a bike. Or you had a car, and it has all these gadgets and pedals, and, and you didn't know how to drive. Or can you guys remember when this thing was invented and we didn't, nobody knew how to use it. We learned in school. It was called the internet. But we learned. We learned how to sit there and use our fingers and our mouse. Or remember the first time you were taught how to play solitaire. Before then, you didn't know how to play solitaire. Or when the smartphone came out. Or the bag phone. What do you mean this phone will work without being connected to my house? 
those of you guys who knew about the bag phone the, and the car phone and all that, how do you guys still believe that we talked to Na- uh, the moon? Anyway, I'll forget it. I'll, I, won't, I won't say any more about that, but anyway, moving on. We have time to read. You have time to read. There are 66 books in the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. I'm here to tell you that the truth has been around since the beginning. But we don't like the truth. We want to come up with lies. We can come up with lies about anything. Our minds are absolutely amazing. And, and I'm not being smart about that. It, they really are. When you go into a library or a bookstore, do me a favor. Go over to the fantasy section. And people in their minds, in their imagination, created some amazing things. We had some people create Languages that don't exist. Who's ever read The Hobbit? Or Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. Anybody watch Star Wars? Some of those people speak languages that don't exist. They just came up with it. We have Lord of the Rings with an elvish language in it. We have Star Wars and Spaceballs and Back to the Future. I had to throw in some Mel Brooks. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> but our brains are capable of coming up with some pretty cool stuff. But the truth, no, the truth is boring. And that doesn't look pretty, that doesn't look boring to me. Looks pretty amazing. The only thing constant from the beginning is that there was truth and the people wanted the lie. That there was the standard, but people wanted to go the other way. Uh, John? Because what's the truth? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That is the gospel. That is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus es la respuesta. Jesus is the answer. Sorry. And everywhere you are going, if you know God, everywhere that you are going, know this, that God went before you and is waiting for you. He's preparing it. He's prepared you. He's equipping you. And where you are going is scary. And where you are going, there's going to be a fight. Your morality is going to be challenged. It's going to be funner. I'm just glad we don't have any English teachers in here. (laughs) Yeah. I guess we do. She's over there. We have kids going off to college. We have people starting new jobs. Robbie, how's that new job? (laughs) Thumbs up. All right. Your moral standard is what you're taking in there. You come here to get equipped. You come and visit with God. Pray to God. Read your Bible to get equipped 
to go out there and fight. There are lots of opportunities to be immoral. And each one of those opportunity was an opportunity to be moral. Not what the world says is moral, but what God says it's moral. And the only way you'll be able to figure out what the difference is, is if you read your rule book. You want to know what not to do? Go read about it. You want to know what to do? Go read about it. All those good works, we read about what it does and what what it does to your life. What it does to your life is that it's, it's pleasing to God. That's it. You should do it because it's pleasing to God. What's the opposite of pleasing God? Disappointing God? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We have a lot to be worried about. We do. And the only way we can fight off that worry is by getting prepared. Equip yourself. Know the word. Know God. Make God known. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks and praise for this day, Lord, for your word, for this church and the people in it. Lord, I ask that you would equip them with knowledge, wisdom, courage, that you would use this church as your servants. That we would infiltrate all of our circles with the truth and lead more people to you. Lord, I lift up Marty to you. I lift up Kirsten to you as she's going off on her new adventures. All of the kids from my youth group, Lord, that are growing up, I lift them up to you and that they continue to know you, pray to you, read your word, tell others about you, lead others to you, that the work that was done in this church would be such a fruitful tree. Lord, bless us, guide us, protect us. Thank you, Lord, for going ahead of us and preparing it for us. Give us the courage to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.